Hello, everybody. This is Anthony Bionis from Mission Star Podcast, and uh, it's been a good month, more than a month, since we had a Mission Star Podcast podcast. <laughs> Anyways, um, so with me tonight, uh, we've got uh, our video guy, Jace. Hello. We've got our, uh, our, our viewer slash anything we really put on him. Um, you also you see him a lot on the Facebook uh, feed, uh, Chris Thurm. Yo. And joining us, you know, it's funny, it's like, you're always a special guest, but really at this point, you're just a regular on our show. Um, great Deeds. Yeah. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Great Deeds, welcome again to our podcast. Um, and so It's always nice being here. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, it's nice to have you inside. <laughs> 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 um, so on tonight's podcast, our main discussion is uh, digital games. Um, whether, they, whether they actually work or not. Uh, and the kind of argument as far as like why that spurred up is because of recent uh, launches like SimCity and uh, Diablo 3. They haven't, launches haven't gone that well. So we'll talk about it tonight. But first, we have to do this. What you guys have been up to? Um, I think we'll be a few, Jace. You go first. Uh, what have I been up to? Well, I started the whole Rave to the J video network the past three weeks. I guess it has been now. Mm-hmm. Um, one for Mission Star Podcast, one for my behind the scenes, and then my main channel. Then also working with the Mission Star Podcast YouTube channels and a colleague of mine, his uh, Zorum channel network as well. Uh, getting the new format set up for the weekly convention roundups, which you guys have been liking. I've been seeing the views on that, which is really nice. I uh, hope to make more of those. Uh, other than that, preparing to um, go out of state for a couple weeks. Oh, nice. Where to? Uh, North Carolina, actually. Oh, North Carolina. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Got family out there. Looking uh, forward to getting onto the military base out there uh, for a little bit and buy all new gear with the discounts <laughs> awesome they going going to the birthplace of where epic games started <laughs> <laughs> maybe tour around there a little bit mm-hmm. awesome cool um is there anything else you've been up to or has kind of been taking up most of your time uh it's been busy work um a lot of uh, video stuff photography stuff coming up so a lot of work and then a lot of stuff on the uh kind of social media side of everything too so taking up most of my time okay awesome um greg i have not sp- spoken to you in a long time nor have you been on here for a long time either so <laughs> what how, how have you been man i've been pretty good uh i was recently uh me and my brother were recently hired to do um bi-weekly trivia at a bar in midtown sacramento no way as as like host or as yeah he well he's he's more of like the <clears throat> he works with the crowd better than i do he's been doing um uh improv for a very long time and so when he, we were given the opportunity i was just like you you're on stage i'll be the vanna white to your pat sajak as long as we can work together on the trivia <laughs> that is awesome um, yeah, so our first, what was really funny was when we were hired, they said, well, you're going to do the first, because th- every every month they have a theme, a theme um, trivia night. Mm-hmm. And Josh and I were like, well, what, what do we want to do? And uh, we had a few things on, on, the, on the table, and what we decided on was a Star Wars night. Mm. Um, let me explain how difficult it is to write Star Wars trivia for a bar. <laughs> um, you have to make sure that the trivia isn't too hard. Mm-hmm. And you have to make sure it's not too easy, because you're gonna get people that are gonna show up that are gonna sweep the fucking table, mm-hmm. or floor, whatever you're using the broom on, um, and then you have people who are just, I know that like there's a robot named C3PO and R2D2, and that's about as far as it goes. Like you get those people showing up too. So we wanted people to have fun, but you know not take it too seriously while at the same time having the questions be legit. Mm-hmm. And then we thought about like. Oh, should we do extended universe? No, let's just keep it. Like it was just a really long, drawn out process before we've had a final list. And we we're really proud of what the list was. A lot of people complimented how like how much fun it was in the beginning, but as the second round started, it was like, okay, we're definitely weeding out the the uh lesser fans, if you will, mm-hmm. but not in a way that made them feel insuperior. 
or mm. like in or, sorry inferior is what I should have said. Mm, okay. So that was a lot of fun. Um, however, this upcoming Tuesday, which I don't know when you're going to air this, but uh, um, on the 26th is uh, our next showing, and we already have a finalized trivia list, and that's just that's just standard trivia. Mm, okay. No theme. Um, so yeah, but it's a lot of fun. We get we get paid for it. We get free drinks while we're working. Mm, so nice. That sounds like a really good gig. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's I'm a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let me in so on if, that. <laughs> if you guys, hey, if you guys are free Tuesday nights, um, every Tuesday night between nine and eleven, they have the trivia there. So nice. It's uh, the Press Club, which for the life of me, I can never remember the damn cross street. Mm -hmm. But I will look it up and uh, put it in the description on the or the thing on Skype, whatever. Nice. Um, but anyway, um, on top of that, that's like that's my side thing right now. What I'm like, what I'm playing because I'm not really watching any TV. Right, right. Uh, I f rented and beat Tomb Raider, the new Tomb Raider. Ah, uh, yes. Highly recommend. Okay, highly. so I have to ask this because like it, it's been bothering me ever since I I kind of saw the direction they went with the game. How do you feel about uh, Laura Croft um, being, at one point, you know, this frail, just kind of, you know, helpless girl um, in the game, and then when she finally kills somebody, she, she turns to Commando? Um, well, they address it in the, in the game because, uh, you know, the, the, the guy that she looks up to in the game, he tells her over a walkie-talkie, like, you know, avoid people as much as you can. You don't have to kill anybody. Now, the game kind of forces you to kill everybody because that's just... Everybody, this is Anthony Bionis from Mission Star Podcast, and uh, it's been a good month, more than a month, since we had a Mission Star Podcast podcast. <laughs> Anyways, um, so with me tonight, uh, we've got uh, our video guy, Jace. Hello. We've got our, uh, our, our reviewer slash anything we really put on him. Um, you also you see, him, see him a lot on the Facebook uh, feed, uh, Chris Sturm. Yo, and joining us, you know, it's funny. It's like you're always a special guest, but really at this point, you're just a regular on our show. Um, great deeds. Yeah. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, great deeds. Welcome again to our podcast. Um, and so it's always nice being here. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, it's it's nice to have you inside. <laughs> 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 Um, so on tonight's podcast, our main discussion is uh, digital games, um, whether, they, whether they actually work or not. Uh, and the kind of argument as far as like why that spurred up is because of recent uh, launches like SimCity and uh, Diablo 3, the haven't, launches haven't gone that well. So we'll talk about it tonight, but first we have to do this. I wish you guys have been up to. Um, I think we'll be a few, Jace. You go first. Oh. Uh... What have I been up to? Well, I started the whole Rave to the J video network the past three weeks. I guess it has been now. Mm -hmm. um, one for Mission Star Podcast, one for my behind the scenes, and then my main channel. Then also working with the Mission Start Podcast YouTube channels and a colleague of mine, his uh, Zorum channel network as well. Uh, getting the new format set up for the weekly convention roundups, which you guys have been liking. I've been seeing views on that, which is really nice. I uh, hope to make more of those. Uh, other than that, preparing to um, go out of state for a couple weeks. Oh, nice. Where to? Uh, North Carolina, actually. Oh, North Carolina. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Got family out there. Looking uh, forward to getting onto the military base out there uh, for a little bit and buy all new gear with the discounts <laughs> awesome they going going to the birthplace of where epic games started <laughs> <laughs> maybe tour around there a little bit mm -hmm. awesome cool 
Um, is there anything else you've been up to, or just kind of been taking up most of your time? Uh, it's been busy work. Um, a lot of uh, video stuff, photography stuff coming up. So a lot of work, and then a lot of stuff on the uh, kind of social media side of everything too. So taking up most of my time. Okay, awesome. Um, Greg, I have not sp spoken to you in a long time. Nor have you been on here for a long time either. So, <laughs> what? How how have you been, man? I've been pretty good. Uh, I was recently, uh, me and my brother were recently hired to do um, bi-weekly trivia at a bar in Midtown Sacramento. No way. As as like host or as? Yeah, he. Well, he's he's more of like the. <clears throat> he works with the crowd better than I do. He's been doing. Um, uh, improv for a very long time and so when he, we were given the opportunity I was just like you you're on stage I'll be the Vanna White to your Pat Sajak as long as we can work together on the trivia <laughs> that is awesome um, yeah so our first what was really funny was when we were hired they said well you're gonna do the first because th every every month they have a theme a theme um, trivia night mm -hmm. and Josh and I were like well what what do we want to do and uh, we had a few things on on the on the table and what we decided on was a Star Wars night. Mm. Um, let me explain how difficult it is to write Star Wars trivia for a bar. <laughs> um, you have to make sure that the trivia isn't too hard mm -hmm. and you have to make sure it's not too easy because you're going to get people that are going to show up that are going to sweep the fucking table mm -hmm. or floor, whatever you're using the broom on. Um, <clears throat> and then you have people who are just I know that, like, there's a robot named C-3PO and R2-D2, and that's about as far as it goes. Like, you get those people showing up, too. So we wanted people to have fun, but, you know, not take it too seriously, while at the same time having the questions be legit. Mm -hmm. And then we thought about, like, oh, should we do Extended Universe? No, let's just keep it. Like, it was just a really long, drawn-out process mm -hmm. before we had a final list. And we were really proud of what the list was. A lot of people complimented how, like how much fun it was in the beginning, but as the second round started, it was like, okay, we're definitely weeding out the the uh, lesser fans, if you will, mm -hmm. but not in a way that made them feel in superior, or mm. like, in, or, I'm sorry, inferior is what I should have said. Mm, okay. So that was a lot of fun. Um, however, this upcoming Tuesday, which I don't know when you're going to air this, but uh, um, on the 26th is... Uh, our next showing and we already have a finalized trivia list and that's just that's just standard trivia mm, okay no theme um so yeah but it's a lot of fun we get we get paid for it we get free drinks while we're working mm, so nice that sounds like a really good gig <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's a lot of fun <laughs> <laughs> let me in well, on that <laughs> if you guys hey if you guys are free tuesday nights um, every Tuesday night between nine and eleven, they have the trivia there. So nice. It's uh, the Press Club, which for the life of me, I can never remember the damn cross street. Mm -hmm. But I will look it up and uh, put it in the description on the or the thing on Skype, whatever. Nice. Um, but anyway, um, on top of that, that's like that's my side thing right now. What I'm like, what I'm playing because I'm not really watching any TV. Right, right. Uh, I. Rented and beat Tomb Raider, the new Tomb Raider. Ah, uh, yes. Highly recommend. Okay, highly. so I have to ask this because like it, it's been bothering me ever since I, I kind of saw the direction they went with the game. How do you feel about uh, Lara Croft um, being at one point, you know, this frail, just kind of, you know, helpless girl um, in the game, and then when she finally kills somebody, she, she turns to Commando. Um. Well, they address it in the, in the game, because, uh, you know, the, the, the guy that she looks up to in the game, he tells her over a walkie-talkie, like, you know, avoid people as much as you can. You don't have to kill anybody. Now, the game kind of forces you to kill everybody, because that's just how you progress in the game. Mm -hmm. Just fine and all, because it's, it's a fun game mechanic to kill people, but... Right. Um... When uh, when he when he asked her like have you killed anybody or some some of that effect she was like yeah and it was a lot easier than I thought like basically huh. she's already had it in her that she could do that and she has no problems with it hmm. um, but she's still a really good person because everybody that was on this boat that she, that crash land on the on the island right um, she she has this strong desire to save there was people that didn't that crash land on the island in like the middle of the game that she didn't even know. And she was like, I have to go save them. Hmm. So she's still a really good person. 
she's just really good at defending herself too. Okay, I I, I just so, I just like how you worded that. It's like she's a really good person, but she has no problems killing people. <laughs> no, she does. Like because that's like that's that's one of the great mechanics of the game is that early on, uh, before you really start killing anybody, mm-hmm. um, uh, you're you're put into situations that are just. Oh God, Laura! I'm sorry. I don't. <laughs> I don't mean for this to happen to you. Right. And uh, like there is a there is a scene that was changed before the final release of the game where Laura is supposed to be like raped mm. if you fuck up. Mm. Um, her hands are tied behind her back. She's pulled out, and instead they changed it from him like proceeding to rape her to him strangling her. Ah, oh, I see. And I recognized it right away, so my joke, anytime I talk to somebody who's gotten to that part, I was like, how do you like being raped when you fucked up that part? Because everyone does. <laughs> Honestly, I haven't talked to anyone who hasn't fucked up on that part. Mm. And everyone's like, hey, raped? She got strangled. And I was like, yeah, that was, she was supposed to get raped. Mm-hmm. Like, that was, that was the whole idea. Like, it would cut out before anything you saw anything, clearly. But mm-hmm. she's on an island full of dudes who've lived there for years without any female contact. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that a young beautiful looking girl like Laura Croft. <laughs> yeah. They're going to they're going to try to rape. Oh. Um yeah. mm-hmm. I'm just saying it's Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> just saying, like, we're we're not suggesting anything. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> No, but if if you were like no, if, I, I, no, no way do I condone rape. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm just saying if you were to write a script and there were, you know, there were you know, if a woman went into a fucking prison full of guys and there was no one to really help her what do you think would happen? Yeah, true. It's just kind of like, it makes sense. But, you know, people are very, like, people still consider video games not as that much of an adult art form yet. Not like movies. Because mm-hmm. movies, you can get away with that shit, and people are like, it's art. <laughs> yeah. People are still kind of on the fence about video games, so yeah, they had, they had to change that. But as for, like, the gameplay, it's smooth. Mm-hmm. It is completely intuitive. Um Granted, she does move a little Nathan Drakey, mm-hmm. but I'm okay with that because Nathan Drake controls really well. Um, you know, he, he both you know this new Laura and and Nathan Drake react to the environments that they're in. You know, people constantly rip on Tomb Raider for ripping off Uncharted, but it's in turn Uncharted kind of ripped off. Uh, uh, Tomb Raider before this new Tomb Raider. Yeah, I I can't find. I can't find how people are making that comparison between Tomb Raider and the new one and, and Uncharted and saying, like, Tomb Raider ripped off Uncharted. It's like, what? But Tomb Raider's yeah. been doing this for years. <laughs> they- exactly. Like, the the platforming, the puzzle solving, like, all of that is in this game and done in a way that doesn't make me feel stupid. Hmm. The puzzles aren't, like, the puzzles aren't portal hard, right? but they aren't, like, you know, um, an algebraic equation that a whole chalkboard needs hard. Right. They're, you know, they're just, they're like, okay, what do I got to so do? And then Zelda like, Zelda hard. Right, right. There's Zelda hard. Thank you. That's actually a perfect analogy. Speaking of Zelda, much like with Zelda or Metroid, this game plays like that. Mm. Throughout the course of the game, you are given new items that help you do things as you progress through the game. Mm. So, for example, when you get your bow and arrow, you are able to upgrade it. But at a different point down the road in the game, you are given a compound bow. And this basically, the, the difference between the regular bow and this bow is its tensile strength its strength is so much stronger that you can actually shoot it into certain walls with a rope, and that way that's how you get from point A to point B. Hmm. Um, whereas previously that was, you had to find, like, the right kind of thing. It's very, and I, I say this, like, so... It's Metroid-esque in that sense that you never really have to backtrack. There's like once or twice in the game you have to backtrack, but 90% of the time it's just forward progression. Mm. You can go back to areas and do the or- collecting thing, but like the, the reason I say Metroid-esque because in, in Metroid, when you backtrack, you have to backtrack because um, the game's designed that way. You have to go back and finish something that is storyline purposes. With this game, it's not like that. Um, it's uh, it's very it's very like let's move forward. Like you do, co- like I said, you do come back to areas that you were before, but that's just to to move on. That's like to go through that area. Right, right. So it's it's so you could find a good analogy 
to that? Would it be like God of War in that aspect to those who haven't played? Uh, in, in level progression, yes. In how the game's designed, no. Yeah. Um, and I say, I say that mainly in the pretense that, like with the Zelda thing, mm-hmm. um, it, uh, you, you progress by you know, getting new abilities. But the abilities help you in the next section you're going to. Like much like with Zelda, right? Like you get this, like when you get the sky hook, or not, is a sky hook, or no, that's that's Bioshock Infinite. When you get the um, ah, oh, the damn thing in in the Ocarina hook of Time, hook shot, hook shot. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I couldn't believe I forgot that. Uh, when you get the hook shot, the next section you go into, right after you after you acquire the hook shot, you have to use the hook shot. It's it's the game's designed that way. Laura Croft is exactly the same way. Mm. Um, or I'm sorry, Tomb Raider is exactly the same way. <laughs> right, right. Whereas uh, like Nathan Drake was very, or not Nathan Drake. Keep doing that. Keep naming the games off the main character. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 an awesome game. It takes a lot of elements that are good in other games and combines it in this game and gives you a story that. And to be honest, it's an okay story. I think the issue I have with the story is it's very um, uh, transparent. Mm. You see everything coming a mile away. You see who's going to betray you and who's not going to betray you. You, uh, you kind of see where the story's going to go. You see how it's going to end. And it, it, there's, there's no, there's no part surprise. in it that, yeah, there's no surprise, but, uh, what makes the game fun and what makes you want to finish it is that it's just fun to play. Nice. Awesome. So I yeah, highly recommend it. It's, Definitely worth a looking at. The, the multiplayer kind of sucks. Right. Simply well, <laughs> it's, it's not fleshed out. Get this. Hmm. 2013, no party system. As far as, having, as far as like games or just in, no, in... like like in most games, when there's a multiplayer, you party up with your friends and then you go into matchmaking. Uh huh. This game does not have that. Um. Huh. So you have to piggyback off of friends. Like somebody goes into a game and goes, there's space, join on me. Like you have to do that in order to play with your friends wow. in the same match. Yeah, I feel like with this game, they really focus on the single player than they did multiplayer. They shouldn't even have added a multiplayer. Like, I think uh, they felt uh, like, oh, we need a multiplayer to uh, have a game that people are going to want to buy because everyone's all about the multiplayer, so they just shoved it in last minute. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean... They could that that's that's an entire different podcast we can we can go to later on. <laughs> well, um, no, I mean the uh, the point is clear. I think I think you know he that's absolutely why they put it in. And but my but still even on that note, like it's not well fleshed out. Even even stuff that you do in the matches isn't fleshed out. Like they were like it was it was a very like last note kind of thing during development. It felt like so right. right. And taking what you say there later on, I'm actually going to take what you say and move it towards why digital games and actual physical copies work and don't work. Well, before right, but, right, but, right. yeah, before so, we, yeah, we have one more <laughs> <laughs> before we do that. Uh, <laughs> well, the other uh, so off of Tomb Raider, the other game that I've been playing is uh, um, Gears of War Judgment. Yes. Okay. Now, a lot of people. Yeah. I, a, lot, I, I, a lot of. What's that? Oh no! I was, I was gonna say, like, I've been hearing a lot of slack or a lot of uh, flack from people uh, about the game just because it doesn't have certain modes in multiplayer. Um, but I hear what, what single player is actually pretty good. Well, it's actually really funny you say that because I think single player is the weakest part of the game. Really? Yes. Um. The reason I say that is because the other Gears of War games, the story was very, uh, like, let's be honest. Gears of War is the equivalent to a B-movie. Yeah, it is. Um, you can't <laughs> take it seriously. You have to just play it for what it is. And not once in the in the time that you play it should you ever sit there and go, you know, am I playing a game for meatheads? Because it's it's just a game. It's just it's just mindless fun. And, and mm-hmm. Whenever someone puts more than that into it, it kind of frustrates me. So that's why I say that with the multiplayer or with the whole game, as, the game as a whole. Um, I hear too much on like on the internet about how, uh, you know, Gears of War is a kids' game. Gears of War is essentially like a heavier Call of Duty, and it it, it kind of frustrates me because if if I wanted people to be pretentious about this game, um. Or if, if people, uh, let me phrase that. If if I felt like people needed to be pretentious about this game, um, 
I would I would have like I don't know. There's a thought there, and it's not coming to me, so I'll move on. But point is, people are pretentious about this game. It drives me nuts. Okay. The storyline, the way that it's played out, is kind of like Halo ODST. You're at the end of the game when you play, or when you see the main characters that you play as, and they retell what happened earlier in like a couple days ago or whatever, because they're on a tribunal for committing a war crime. Mm-hmm. Um. The way the reason it's interesting as to why it's told like that is because the campaign then becomes very arcadey. So you go into a section of like you go into a level essentially, and um, there's a point A to point B. You have to get to point B. When you get when you start the level, there's these giant glowing gear symbols. You go up to it. It says declassified, and it gives you an extra challenge. Like there's a time limit. You can only use this tiny kind of gun. Um, you can only like it, it. Like it just gives you an extra challenge. I was trying to remember another one, but I'm drawing a complete blank. Oh, yeah. that was the other one that drove me and my buddy insane. Was that it would say like your vision is impaired. So there's this one moment where it was like the dust is so heavy that you can't see like two feet in front of your face, and that was legit. Mm. We're like we just hunkered in the corner with a shotgun. <laughs> but um. What the declassified sections do is that they kind of tie it into the sense that when, when one of the characters, like, when he wrote the, um, when he or she wrote the, uh, uh, like, what, what happened, mm-hmm. it contradicts to what actually happened. Mm-hmm. And what you're, what you're playing is is what actually happened, not what they retold. Mm-hmm. And, uh, what that, and the reason that, that they do that in the game is because if you accept the declassified to make the challenge or make the game harder, you then get uh, these. You get you get to earn these stars, um, and the stars go towards things you get to play as in multiplayer, like different characters and stuff. Um, so they're not necessary, but they're fun. It adds an extra challenge to the game mm. because the campaign's very arcadey. It's not difficult. It's fucking Gears of War for Christ's sake. <laughs> right, right. Um, it does make it. It does make it more interesting, especially if you play the other three. Right. Uh, How long is the game? Oh, God, it took us... It's actually longer than the other Gears games, because this really? one took us... This one took us about ten hours. Oh, wow. Huh. I, I had a vision that this game would be a lot shorter. Um, oh, okay. I did, too. I absolutely did, too, because I felt like they made this game in a year. It looks exactly like Gears 3. Mm. Like, it almost feels like this... This was planned as a DLC mm-hmm. for Gears 3, and they went, let's just come out with a full game with different game types and new weapons. Hmm. And because of the new weapons, because of the new game types, because of how like how long the story is, it's totally worth the 60 bucks. Hmm. Okay. Um, the multiplayer is... They basically said, like, okay, so there are these modes in Gears 3 that some people liked, but most people didn't. How about we just put the ones in that most people played? Like Team Deathmatch, Domination, um, and uh, which were, you know, the major two. Like, the Capture the Flag was not popular at all, um, which was actually, it wasn't Capture the Flag, it was Capture capture the Leader. Yeah. Which, which, yeah, if you played that, basically, if you didn't play that, one person on the team was the leader, you down them, you pick them up, take them to your base. That was it. Mm-hmm. Um, which I played that, you know, a little bit, but it wasn't my. It wasn't one of the things I played the most. But two of the most popular things that they had had in Gears, two and then and then the three, was uh, um, Horde mode and Beast mode. Mm-hmm. And people genuinely really liked Horde mode and Beast mode. Um, and when I played that in three, one of the things I'd said to my friends were, how how was it not, a, um an idea to combine these two so that way it's locusts versus humans. How was that never an idea? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Clearly they thought of that for, for judgment. Because overrun mode is easily one of my favorite things on this planet. Wow. Um, the way that they do it is, did you guys ever play uh, uh, Left 4 Dead 1 or 2? Yes. Jace? Uh, uh, nope. I played a little bit of 2. Okay. Did you guys ever play the multiplayer? Uh, no. I played a little bit of it. Okay. 
what I thoroughly enjoyed about the multiplayer was that um, you would play on a full level, so like matches would last like 30, 40 minutes, mm-hmm. and um, like a full campaign level is what I'm talking about. And uh, one team would start as the humans, and then get to the next uh, safe room, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. The other team are the zombies, and they have every single zombie that zo- or yeah, every single special infected, I should say, was at their disposal. Um, and your job was just to stop them, was to get them killed somehow. A lot of fun. Uh, had a blast playing it because when you play as the humans, you have to be a different type of st- strategic than when as when then when you play as the as the um, zombies. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Very similar. Very similar for Horde. Or not Horde, but Overrun, sorry. Mm. Um, when you're the humans, you have to defend an E-hole cover or, or a evacuation hole cover. Or not evacuation, but a... Um, what should I remember what E stands for? It doesn't matter. Emergence. Emergence, thank you. Emergence yeah. hole. Undo. <laughs> um, and as the locust, you have to destroy said hole, hole cover. Mm. Um, it is incredibly hard... To stop them from destroying the e-hole covers as the humans. Mm. Now, the reason it's hard, and it doesn't bother me, and I'll explain why. When you're the humans, you're just postponing how long it takes them because you're being timed. Mm. Every time that you play a match, whoever starts as the humans, at the end of that match, when they're when they're done being the humans, they then get to be the locust, and go the, through the same thing. Whichever team as the Locust can get to the generator and destroy it the fastest wins. Hmm. I see. So, so it... What's that? I was going to say, so in a sense, it like gives you that pressure of like, you know, fuck, how are we going to defend this hole against the Locust and get our ass kicked to reversing that and like, yeah, that that, that empowering and feeling. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, g- I'll give you an example of a match I played last night. Um, we started as the humans... We stopped them as much as we possibly could, Mm -hmm. and they destroyed our generator, which we were fine with that because they were a good team. Um, Then we got to be the Locust, and I said, we just have to be quicker than them. We were three seconds quicker, no joke. Nice. Um, I even took a screen cap of it, and it was like 10 minutes and 26 seconds to 10 minutes and 29 seconds. Wow. Good And uh, And, you know, the games are not usually like that. That's the closest I've ever seen it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the last match we played, it was, it took them 13 minutes to get to our generator. Damn. But it took us only seven. Oh wow. So like, it's very easy for the for the locust to get to the generator. Mm. It it's not that hard at all. Um. And, uh, but it's very difficult for the humans to stop. But that's fine because you know the whoever plays as the humans, which is slightly shitty, you get to be the locust and get to fucking get your payback. Mm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's just it's yeah, matches are really long, but that's fine because it's a lot of fun. Hmm. Awesome. I never. Yeah. I'm, I, and and now that like me and my buddy have this like pattern with the humans because there's different classes too. Mm. There's a medic, um, a sniper who spots guys. A uh, turret guy who heals defenses, and then a, an ammo guy, mm. and uh, he's the healer, since basically like the healing grenade is really cheap, and you basically can't die unless you get hit by an explosion. Right? Does that healing grenade is that if you if you throw that like in a say in a crowd and say both locusts and humans are in the area, will it heal both or would it heal? Yes. Oh, okay. It heals everyone who's ever, whoever's in the aura of the thing. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's just, that's, like, that's what's great about it. Um, I can't say enough about Overrun Mode, honestly. Like, if I if I were to buy that game and never play the campaign or any other multiplayer mode, I'd just be happy with Overrun Mode. It's that much fun. Awesome. Um, and it does, and that's the great thing about it is, like, Overrun Mode is the most I've ever thought about, like, anything playing Gears of War. Hmm. Ever. Hmm. When I played when I played Horde mode, it was just defend, stop them from killing us. Yeah, that was it. Mm-hmm. In in Beast mode, it was kill them as quickly as possible. This is it's okay if I die because I'll get to respawn if I'm human or locust, and I just have to get to that objective. 
Mm, awesome. So I never, I never get that sensation of like, oh fuck, I can't die. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which I love. I love feeling like it's okay if I die. Mm. So, cool. I rec, I like, I recommend Judgment simply for over and The great thing about that game too is that there's no online pass. So if you were to rent it, you could totally play it. Yay! <laughs> 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 Something they did, did right for a change. <laughs> okay. awesome. I'm done rambling. Okay. Um, Chris, how, what, what have you been up to as, yeah. aside from, uh, taking your vacation to Oregon? <laughs> uh, well, I'm actually been able to finally get started and finish up some of my writing and in fact, uh, a three part Pokemon article that I was covering is just about finished. I'll have it finalized within the next couple of days. Nice. So, you know. And uh, other than that, though, I think that this vacation was exactly what I needed to kind of clear my head from all the other stuff going on in California. But um, other than that, I uh, went through and I got myself that copy of Naruto Storm 3 and surprisingly over the course of one day uh i've nearly thousand out of a thousand bit nice as far as the achievements or as far as uh uh yeah i've nearly got a single one the only thing i'm missing is one story-based event but uh yeah other than that i've got a perfect game fuck yeah and to my knowledge there was no need for, yeah there was no need for uh online uh to actually work with it unless you're going through and modifying your card which that was one part of it but um, other than that though you don't you. have to um, yes. I played uh, I played a little bit of uh, Generations and I thought that was actually a really good well made <laughs> fighting game is it anything like that? well the online uh, combatancy yes and no story mode definitely no um, I'll go through and explain story mode, which, um, if, have you played Storm 2 by any chance? No, I, I, I've actually, I've watched maybe a couple episodes of Naruto, but I haven't, my buddy really loves Naruto, and so we, we bought, or he bought the Generations game, and him and I played the crap out of it, and we thought it was a lot of fun. I actually even started, like, wanting to watch the show because the game was so much fun, <laughs> and, um... And, uh, and then I noticed that, like, right after he bought that, that Storm 3 was coming out. And I was like, oh, I wonder if this game is anything like Generations, because it's just, I hope it's just as much fun. Well, so. I'll say yes and no. Yes, because the fighting style of the game is the exact same one mapped over from the first installments. Okay. Um, although with the substitutions and how it's limited to four, that does carry over, as did from... Uh, uh, from generations. Okay. Now, for the parts that are dissimilar, um, first off, they actually have um, implemented a feature where you can take on multiple combatants at once, since this is supposed to take place at the time of the Great Shinobi War, mm. which happens somewhere... Um, like, uh, if you were to go to Barnes Noble, that's somewhere between volumes 50 to 60, uh. I think. I'm I'm a little off since I don't really have too many of them. Right, right. So, Anthony, if you happen to know which chapters those might be, then that would be appreciated. From what I've seen, because I've, so, I've seen some streams of playing the game, and from the looks of things, it's like it's... Um, I mean, it's like everybody's in this game so far, from what I've seen. Um, and everybody from, like, the past first generation of Naruto to the most current... Uh, uh, season of, of Naruto or manga version of it. So, um, yeah, my not my Naruto knowledge, my Naruto knowledge is, has been uh, has been as great as it used to be. <laughs> Same with mine. <laughs> it's mine's pretty much non-existent. But um, <laughs> yeah, I can say same goes to me. But um, uh, no, in the story mode, it goes back to the sort of free-roaming style that Storm 2 had, where you can go through and go and do all these things in the game, and then if you want to, there are also side missions that you can work with. Mm. And 
that all wor <clears throat> works out well and good. And it also tries to cut it. Uh, ah, tongue tied today. <laughs> it tries to cut past as much BS and as much filler as uh, possible within the game's designs, as it pretty much just leads you through the story, and any side missions are pretty much reserved for end game. So it's a great plus on their end. Mm. Additionally, um, they pick up after the events of Naruto Storm 2, which covered the beginning of Shippuden all the way through the Pain arc. Oh, okay. And, and so for Storm 3, they're picking up after Pain and going all the way uh, through the end of the Great Shinobi War. Mm. So there's that whole frame, and if you wanted to cover anything else, the option to uh, experience prior battles and other events in the Naruto timeline are presented through Ninja World timeline pages, which you unlock by reaching certain conditions through each of the battles or by completing some side missions. Mm. <clears throat> Hmm. And unfortunately, that's where I'm at right now, trying to get the last one so I have a perfect game. Nice. Awesome. But, um, wow. That aside, though, uh, as I mentioned, you can take on multiple opponents. And this is implemented both in the story mode and through multiplayer, where if you're able to get into a lobby, you as well as, I think, up to four people. I'm not sure just because I haven't been able to get into a room for it. Um, you, with some allies, would be able to go through into these battlegrounds and take on hordes of enemies, whether they be uh, the samurai, uh, rogue ninja, or the white zetsu squad. Mm. Although I would presume that uh, it would mostly be along the lines of the white zetsu squad. Um... Throughout the course of the game, though, if there was a point where you had to go through and fight through a mob of enemies, such as when Sasuke takes on the Five Kage Summit, or, again, during the war, then you would go through, and for a stretch of anywhere between 15 minutes or so, that whole section would be dedicated to you running around, and uh, if there are enemies that come towards you, you can attack them and pull off uh, your ninjutsu, but you can never pull off an ultimate during that time just, you know, for logistics reasons. Hmm. Um, other than that, though, I have to say that from Namco and Bandai, that's probably one of the most solid games that I've seen them make in years. Definitely. Uh, Namco and Bandai, as of late, has been putting out some really good games. Um, Naruto now and also... Recently, uh, Tekken Tag 2 and Soul Calibur 5. So, fighting game-wise, and uh, they've been putting out some pretty good games as of late. <laughs> Although, I will say that when it comes to an overall list of everything that they've worked with, as well as, uh, I think it's CyberConnect that was also working in parts with them for the game, mm -hmm. they put together... Uh, I'm actually astonished that I'm saying this, but they have put together the most solid game that I have seen for this entire year. Wow. You're... In fact, most of game... Would you, would you say... I'm it, baffled. Would you, would you say this is your your your, your preemptive game of the year so far? <laughs> um, in regards to Best Fighter, yes, I would give that. Um, I know people could contest Fire Emblem Awakening, which I've just started playing. It's fun, but that may very well fall into its own category. But uh, for Best Fighter on a home console, I would definitely say yes, it stands out as one of the best games that I have played as of late. Mm. Uh, in regards to overall storytelling and general presentation, it does stand notches above what I've seen. It also does not uh, baby the player. And just throws them right into it, but still has the little tips that load up in the loading screens for those who don't know how to play. Mm. So, 
in the end, I have to say that as a game, it's very mature. It leads, you know, it leads its audience directly into the action. There's no sugarcoating anything. There's just like they cut out all BS. No holds barred. They wanted to get right to the point. If you wanted to do other stuff, you could do it later. But um, but yeah. Awesome. And uh, oh, I almost forgot. In regards to story mode, on quite a few occasions they implemented something known as the ultimate decision factor, where the players actually get to choose how difficult large strings of fights or boss fights are going to be for them. And uh, that is first made in the prologue during the Minato versus Masked Man fight, where you can go with the legendary route, which is supposed to be harder, and there are certain limitations that are placed on the player, and then there are uh, then there's the hero route, which both of them are chronologically accurate, and to story, it both of them are accurate. They're just different ways that you can go about your fights to make it easier or harder on yourself. Hmm. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, that though, like I said, it's quite possibly the most solid game I've seen in years. Awesome. That sounds awesome, dude. Um, anything else you've been up to, or is, uh, is that... Um, that I've been, uh, weeping as I pick up all these games that I have on pre-order. I thought that November was bad. Oh, no. No, 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 no. It is. uh, Like, oh, hey, it's another couple weeks. Better go pick up another game. Mm. Oh, March is the worst. And while... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, tell me about it. And weirdly enough, last time I was up here, which was in June, I went through and I pre-ordered and paid off Bioshock Infinite. Here I am on spring break a year later, and oh yeah, they just happen to release it while I'm up here. <laughs> How convenient. Um, yeah. I, I have, <laughs> I, I'm per- okay with it. Yeah, I mentioned no tax is a nice plus. I know, right? Uh, it was funny. It's like I did the same thing when I was in Oregon for one time. Um, I was up there and uh, I, uh, I had money at the time. And I was like going to get two games, and uh, I realized like we're taking a vacation up in Oregon. It's like, oh, awesome. So I went up to the Oregon. Um, it was you know a family reunion, and I went to go buy uh, at the time Assassin's Creed and Mass Effect. And yeah, no taxes. That's that's the great thing about Oregon. <laughs> Awesome. Um, oh, um, one last thing. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind me interjecting, one oh. last thing. Yeah, while ahead. I was in GameStop, apparently, sorry, um, while I was in GameStop, apparently they have a promotional offer going on where if you pre-order the guide while you still can, they'll go ahead and throw in the season pass for free. Really? Wait, 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 wait really? For, for yeah, all I, games or just specific ones? For Bioshock. Oh, uh, okay. That's what, I know that okay. this is really <laughs> short notice, and probably by the time this comes out, uh, it's going to tick off a lot of people. But when I was up here, they flat out said if you pre order the, you know, if you pre order the strategy guide, we'll give you the season pass for free. And that's 20 bucks. So nice. if you get the regular guide, then you're getting $42 worth of stuff for 22 Mm hmm. And if you get the uh, collector's edition, you get the nice book, the keychain, and you know twenty bucks sent your way for free. Nice, awesome. So, uh, I at actually, the very least, you guys can. Le- I actually legitimately hate that. <laughs> I know, but like, it, not, not too bad. I mean, well, yeah. There's a, there's a reason I hate that, and and I could get into it. Right, right. But I don't know if. <laughs> You know, time and whatnot. Right, right. We'll we'll save it for another time. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'll do mine real quickly. Um, so uh, I've been enjoying spring break. Um, I just got off of school. I think a couple of days ago. So I am sleeping a lot, <laughs> and I'm enjoying it. Um, but I have been 
as of late, I've been watching the PAX 2013 East archives, or archives, whatever, how you say it. Um, by the time you listen to this, PAX would have been already a week ago. Um, and I just really enjoy watching the panels that they, they air on Twitch, um, as well as just like the other things they do on there. Uh, it's really awesome. I was, I was actually watching the, um, the panel a minute ago about, um, about Dust and how it was made. And the, the developer and the writer, writer was there, you know, talking about the game and answering questions. Um, and that was really cool. I really enjoyed that. Other than that, though, as far as, like, uh, anything else-wise, uh, I've been getting ready for uh, Soccer Con uh, for next week. By the time you listen to this, I'll be ready there. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited. Every time I keep talking to my friend, she tells me it's, like, basically fanime, but better. So I'm just like, oh my god, I cannot wait to go. Uh, <laughs> so I'm really, really excited. It's up, it's up in Seattle. Um, but you know, with SakuraCon being how it is now, it might just beat FanMay out flat out with how FanMay is organizing everything. Right, right. It, the thing is, though, is like, it, I, I said to my friend, if I go to SakuraCon and I really enjoy my time there, um, I might have it a yearly thing like I do a FanMay. So, um, I'm really Let excited. me know how it is. Yeah. Because I might join you on that since I'm not going to a lot of the conventions now. Yeah, I'm really excited. It's all that you guys know how it goes. Um, uh, so, aside from those things, like, I haven't been gaming much, I will say. I did beat Devil May Cry, like, I think a week ago. Um, for, 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 for what it was and what the and people were getting flagged for, the game was actually pretty good. Like, like I don't understand why people are still butter about you know dante and i being you know dante from the previous stuff may cry games but like the game i felt like and i i played this on normal um just because i feel kind of like kind of like you greg like i want to play the game as it is and not you know challenge myself it, it, unless it's like a game where i have to put on hardware you know like halo you know or whatnot to to make it give me a bit more challenge um, well i've always i've always felt the way that like uh computer is a predis- predispositioned or pre Whatever, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Um, area of, go- of where they're going to go, of what they're going to do, how they're going to attack. Mm-hmm. Um, a human, however, is going to do different things. And I don't get mad when I'm killed by a human because, <laughs> um, you know, they just outwitted me. That's all that is. And that's fine by me because that's, that's a human. Right. When a computer does it, I get very angry. Yeah. Because I don't, that's not, that I don't like that. That might just be me being weird. I don't care what people want to call it. Right. But that's that is precisely why I don't. Uh, that's why I play all of my campaigns on easy. Mm-hmm. Or I do it on you know a higher difficulty if it's a you know co-op game. Right. Right. And I, I definitely get that. Uh, yeah, I do the same as you. <laughs> I play it on easy just because it's like okay if it's someone else I don't mind as much because that means they're just smarter than what I did or they did something that I you know should have done or I shouldn't have done something right but I don't like being beat by the computer definitely I, no I hate it I absolutely despise it it's 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 one of those things where it's like I guess maybe you know when I you know as I'm growing up there's too many movies of computers outwitting humans and Maybe that got into my head, and it just bothers me. Mm-hmm. I, it could be just that it's not fun to die against a computer. Like, when I'm playing an RPG, fine. Fine, because I'm basically playing a game of numbered chess. Yeah. yeah. That's all that is. Um, but when it's, like, when it's a shooter or when it's a, you know, an action game like Devil May Cry, no, fuck that. <laughs> I can't. Pardon my language, but fuck that. No, wait. You can curse on this show. It's I don't I don't <laughs> mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really enjoyed the game. Um, the game wasn't as hard. The only hard part I had was like the second to the last. No, no, the third to the last boss, and then the last boss himself. Um, which I felt was a bit of a pain. The only issue I have with the game is that I felt like they didn't tell you enough clues to how you would defeat the boss. Um, because Especially with the, with the last boss, they don't really tell you. Like, the only hint they might have given you is that the person that you were attacking was giving you orbs for your for your uh, double trigger. Um, but they weren't really telling you, use this uh, double trigger to 
uh, kill him, or else you be always be blo- or, you'll, or else you be hitting the clone and not able to, to hit the target you want to. So it's it, that's not only issue with the game, but other than that, I really enjoyed it. I I have no problems with it. So, um, but yeah, I've been that's what I've been up to, and the games will be you know playing in the next when I have time to um, will probably be in this order: Dead Space Three, Tomb Raider. Uh, and Star Starcraft 2, Heart of the Swarm, and then Bioshock Infinite. So, yeah, I got a lot on my plate. But I'm, um, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Bioshock I'm Infinite's not playing. next on my plate. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not the one playing a lot of games. I've been sitting around playing uh, Project Diva F on the Vita. <laughs> yes, I saw that. You were you having a lot of fun with that, aren't you? <laughs> oh, I'm having, I'm having a lot of fun with the AR mode. I went to the Asian Art Museum yesterday, and we were making Miku be a perv. <laughs> I saw that. I saw those yeah. pictures. <laughs> I just, I just saw that on your Facebook page. <laughs> yeah, there was a, it was a, um, st- a stone statue of a guy that had a, I guess, a really nice ass, <laughs> and we posed Miku pointing to it. It's, it's okay. It's art. Nice. <laughs> it, it's, it is art, and uh, I'm making art with Miku. <laughs> awesome. Um. Real quick, I have a question for all of you guys. Are you guys interested in the fighting game uh, Injustice? Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> you, you can that to home how big we're born have right now. It is. I cannot wait. Stop roping it against the mic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reason I ask is because uh, DC had re- is releasing 10 comic books up to the, you know, the day of release, like for the next 10 weeks or whatever, um, that explain the story into... Injustice. Um, yes, uh, it's not really worth a read just because it's way too easy to read. So if you don't mind, I want to give a quick what it is. Okay. I, I think it might have said this before, though. Um, I don't think on the podcast I, don't, I haven't because I just read these like recently. Oh, okay. All right. Then go right ahead. Um, the idea is that uh, Superman has impregnated Lois Lane with a baby. Uh, Joker then decides... I'm, fu- I'm done messing with Batman. I'm going to go mess with Superman. Uh, puts a device inside Lois, like kidnaps her, puts a device inside Lois Lane. By the way, killing Jimmy Olsen in the process. Mm-hmm. Um, puts a device in her that basically says if, if her heartbeat stops, um, a nuclear device will go off. Where's that nuclear device? In the middle of, of uh, Metropolis. Mm. Um, so Joker then kidnaps her. Batman then, or Superman then goes and, and figures out where she is. He proceeds to save her, but then he is attacked by Doomsday. Mm. Uh, he then takes Doomsday straight into space, and in the process of that, Batman then figures out that Joker went and, t- uh, went and took Scarecrow's um, fear gas, or fear toxin, mm-hmm. mixed it with a synthesized uh, uh, car- uh, uh, kryptonite, which is what got into ba- or Superman's bloodstream, and he actually ended up taking Lois Lane and her and his unborn child into space. Oh shit! Detonating a bomb in the middle of, of Metropolis. Damn. So uh, there's this great scene where Batman, or, yeah, Superman is like crying over her body, and he tells Wonder Woman like, "Watch over her. I I need to go take care of something." And she goes, "Okay, I'm, that's fine. Go take care of what you need to take care of. You know, you're in mourning. I understand this." He then flies off, but then Hal Jordan figures it out and says, Yo, Superman, chill. Seriously, calm down. You, you cannot go to the Joker. Batman has him in Gotham. He's going to take care of it. Don't worry about it. Batman and Superman says, Get out of my way, dude. I will fuck you up. Get out of my way. <laughs> and Green Lantern goes, No, and then puts him in like a green bubble. Super- Superman, being just unconsolable, breaks out of that giant bubble zips around Hal Jordan taking his ring off before uh, Hal Jordan can blink. Mm. He, uh, how's, as Hal Jordan falls to the earth, Superman then saves him and then flies off and says uh, says something to Hal Jordan about, like, like I don't want to hurt you. And Hal Jordan just goes, think about what you're doing before you do it. That's all I ask. So there's this great conversation between Batman and Joker where Joker's like, do you think you're... Uh, Boy Scout is going to stay a Boy Scout after I've destroyed his life. I got bored messing with you. You're too smart. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get to you. I wanted a challenge. I wanted something different. And Superman was easy. It was way too easy. 
Mm. And Batman's like, look, you may think you got to Superman, but he's one of my closest friends. I know him. He'll stay, uh, uh, not vigilant, but uh, uh, virtuous. He'll stay virtuous. And he's like, really? Will he? Because I'm pretty sure the outcome's going to be way more. And as he says that, Superman flies in through the wall and then grabs Joker. And as Joker says, hilarious, Superman punches through his chest, killing him. Hmm. Damn. Um, what this insu- ins- ins- ensues is that Superman then goes to his Fortress of Solitude and just sulks for a, a while. Um, and here's where I really like where the story has taken a twist. Because one of my favorite things in, in the history of DC is when the DC universe is falling apart. Right. I love that stuff. Because to me, uh, it's too, like, solidly structured. Mm-hmm. And so when it starts to crumble, I'm just like, yes, it's so good. So Superman goes, look, here's the issue. The world's fucked up. And I've had the ability to do something about it for a long time, but I haven't done anything because... I am concentrated on my own little life in Metropolis. So guess what's happening now, world? You fuck up, I fuck you up. So in the process of doing this, he then, you know, Wonder Woman's helping him, and uh, Ares shows up and says, do you think it's a good idea, Wonder Woman, that you team up with the Man of Steel? I, I think that's a terrible idea. I have foreseen it, and it's a terrible idea. The world is, your world is going to, you know, going to fall apart because of it. And so he goes to, like, she, she gets angry and goes to fight him, and Superman shows up and then helps uh, not kill Aerie, but she pins him in the ground with her sword. Mm-hmm. And he can't move because it's she's, you know, a demigod, so. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, and so then uh, over the course of time, uh, Superman's been like, you know what, I'm basically a god on this fucking planet, so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to create this giant corporation and we're going to be a worldwide police force. Mm. And that's where the game comes into play because Batman and Lex Luthor are now fighting against Superman for him to stop doing this. Nice. Because he has now made a totalitarian world under his regime. I should really pick up on this comics just because, I mean, like, I just love, like, I love the idea of what they're going with, but not only with the game, but just kind of the preempt to it. Um, I, I cannot, I just cannot wait for the, for the game to come out because, like, this, because, you know, the guys creating the game are the guys who made MK9, and the story in MK9 was actually pretty damn good. <laughs> like, the way they, they took from each character, each character turn is telling the story. Um, I cannot wait how Injustice is going to be. Yeah, it looks, it looks like a great game. I guess, like, they're doing this really cool thing where there's a main storyline. Like, I don't know if you guys played the new uh, Mortal Kombat game, but it was it was really well made and well done. Mm-hmm. And the storyline was very, like, you're going to be playing as a series of different characters because our storyline needs you to. Yeah. You're not just, you're not, like, you can go through a whole campaign as one character, but you're going to get a really shitty quick ending. Whereas if you play our, like, fucking six-hour campaign... Mm-hmm. You're just gonna be playing as a series of different characters, right? Which I love, and I think, and, and from what um, Ed Boon said, that's pretty much how the campaign's gonna go for this game. But there are uh, side stuff. So like, Joker's supposed to be dead, but all of a sudden he shows back up, and they just and at PAX they just released a uh, a Harley Quinn trailer where she has now went from villain to good guy. She's a vigilante now, mm-hmm. and um, when Joker shows up, she's just like, you're not real. You're absolutely not real. I, I, I don't know who you are, but you ain't the Joker. And things are not going to be like how they are. And so the show's just kicking his ass. <laughs> so, yeah. It's really interesting how they're going to incorporate different, char- like different superheroes into their own storyline while making it kind of coexist with the main plot that they have. It's very exciting and interesting for that game. Awesome. Sweet. Okay, so um, with that, we're going to take a short break, and then when we come back, we'll talk about our main discussion of tonight. And uh, like I said before, it is about digital games, whether they really work or not. Anyways, uh, we'll be right back. Hello, everyone. This is Anthony Bionis from the Mission Start Podcast. And if you enjoy listening to this podcast, 
as well as our other ones on our website. Um, you can now hear us on Stitcher. Um, you can now hear our show as well on the go with Stitcher Smart Radio, on demand news, talk, and more on your mobile phone. The latest episodes are always available for you, no syncing needed, and no money or storage wasted. Available on your iPhone, iPad, Android phones, and beyond. Downloading is easy. Go to Stitcher.com or check out your app store. Stitcher, smart radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. And we're back. Um, in the words of uh, something we just talked about, um, life is like a hurricane. No. <laughs> <laughs> now you got, now now you got me wanting to sing it. <laughs> you jerk. <laughs> uh, Lasers, race cars, aeroplanes. <laughs> so so for for just quick note for those who didn't know, um, just uh, announced at Paxi's, uh, Capcom announced. Uh, the remastered version of their uh, game, um, DuckTales, or what was the official? Yeah, it's just, it's it just was DuckTales. Duck okay, DuckTales remastered, remastered in HD. Uh, all the original voice actors from the show are gonna voice this, including the original Scrooge McDuck, who is now like 97 years old and still willing to do it. It is pretty awesome. Which, you know, after watching that, I totally forgot that Scrooge McDuck is uh, is Scottish. Yeah, it's funny. How you look back, and that's kind of how. It is now, or you know, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, it's just, it's awesome. He's, I don't know how he obtained that wealth, but yeah, hey. that and like his nephew is like in in the, in the navy. What's his name? Uh, Donald Duck. Yeah. 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 Disney Donald. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of uh, digital games, um, so tonight we are gonna have this main discussion, and the reason why I want to discuss this is because. Um, recently, as of late, big game releases uh, like SimCity and Diablo 3 uh, have launched online um, and always having that always connected uh, uh, setup where you can play the game as long as the server is on. But if the server is not working or it's not on, you can't play the game even though you installed it or have the physical copy. Um, now, I want to get your, get your uh, opinions about this. Um, as far as like how digital games yes we know that digital games are the future of the game industry but looking at how it is now it may uh turn off a lot of people and go back into wanting the physical copy of a game rather than depending on a server and if that server is no longer working that you will no longer have that game on your computer or whatnot and this also goes for xbox live and psn and how that will work out um so i'll open up to you guys do you think maybe that we should still retain physical copies of games or aside from maybe a few mishaps um, that we should keep going with the digital games as long as it works? Question mark? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if, if anyone does mind, I'll go first on this one. Um, here's the thing about having a digital copy of something. It is simply your way of showing that you have a trophy. Um, I purchased this thing. I own this item. Look at me. Look how great this is. Um, but uh, in reality, that is no longer something that I think we need. Um, so let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. 90% of the time when you guys buy items, mm -hmm. when you buy posters, TV, computer, whatever... And a friend comes over, you're like, look at my cool shit, right? Mm -hmm. um, imagine a world where we didn't need any of that. We didn't need to show off what we had. We would never be concerned with getting an item. Uh, we would never be concerned with getting an item online. We would never be concerned with purchasing something digitally. It just wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. Um so I, I don't think that getting something digitally is a bad thing. However, I think companies need to get their shit together, developers need to get their shit together, and figure out a way to uh, fight piracy differently than um, forcing people to play it and have to be online. Because that's the yeah. only reason that Diablo 3 and, and SimCity had this, was because it was their way to fight piracy. 
Yeah. But in turn, it bit them in the ass because now they're spending money on free games for people. Mm-hmm. Um, both uh, both Blizzard and um, uh, EA have like given out free games to people who had these connectivity issues, and that's terrible. That's absolutely awful because that lessens people's interest in playing games from these companies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm, also, aside from just the stuff with uh, digital games, uh, Diablo 3 also had its own fallbacks just for the game itself, so that's also why that one did not uh, pick up as well as it did. Right. The The thing, though, I wanted to throw in is that there were, okay, we, we're, we're living in an age where everybody has an internet connection of some sort, but there are still some people out there who do not have an internet connection, and we're talking about people who you know, live out there in a farm or people who have an Xbox that are living out somewhere that don't have an internet provider that they like or they do and it's just really crappy. So it's, I still find it hard to believe that um, having digital games uh, specifically for people who have internet, um, and yes, sometimes they do release games, the, 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 the like Xbox Live games, on a disc for people to come by and install on onto the 360 or a console. Uh, but I still feel that I don't think there will ever be a, a, a time and era where everybody will have an internet connection as good as you know the next person who has a uh, a, uh, a, sp- a high speed internet. I, I just can't I just can't believe that will ever happen. So I, I yet to figure companies. I mean like like EA and and, and Blizzard. I mean, they want to go digital because they want to get rid of the whole, um, I guess, cost of, of you know making the boxes and and everything like that. Um, oh yeah, because look at production most games cost. That release on look at most games that release on Steam that release uh, as a disc as well. Like it's cheaper on Steam. Period. Definitely. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then the sales. No Steam, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, like, like to to go on the other side, like digital games are pretty fucking awesome. Um, Steam, uh, like you said, Steam is 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 a great tool, and I think like you know, obviously the greatest thing that ever that Valve ever made is from Half Life series. Um, like they have created a platform where you can buy games easily. Um, install them onto your uh, 360. <laughs> install them onto your um, to your computer um, even before the game is uh, launched, um, and have it seamlessly install, and no worries of crashing or anything like that, um, which is awesome. I, I, yes, I, which is pretty sick. Um, See, the only downside that I think people are having right now, why they want a physical copy, is. Uh, trading in for people who do trade in games uh, you know companies like GameStop you know people you know they might not play that game forever you know they're not going to keep it forever mm-hmm. and you know they might want to go out and buy something else or the people who buy a game play it through once and never play it again right um, they need to bring into a system um, of possibly digital uh, game trading or selling their games, you know, like something like Steam could easily implement it because it's a DRM system that Steam has to run. Once that file is downloaded, you can't download it anymore. Steam won't allow it to play. You could easily sell that game to someone else digitally for a lower fee. And because it's all run through that network, they could possibly give a portion of that profit back to the game developers. So that sees it as a little bit of a profit That's for actually a them. really a really smart way of thinking about that i didn't even put that into concept that yeah, would because be so fucking awesome there's a company out right now I don't know if you've heard of it um redigi if mm. uh it's for music where you can actually um sell your legally obtained digital downloads of music to other people um i think apple is trying to come up with a uh, legalized system where they can actually pay people like the music artists a portion of the profits from that so I could see if game companies could implement this, I think that gamers would be happy and the media or the companies that create the games, all the game developers would be happy as well because they get a portion of their profits that they don't get from the physical copies. That's a really, that's a really right. good idea. Well, and there's, and there's also like you were talking about how like there's people that want to trade in their games, which I'm definitely one of those people. Like, honestly, at some point in either the end of this year or the beginning, like... I may trade in 
Gears of War Judgment for Saints Row 4. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very large possibility. And But here's the reason I do that. I would keep Gears of War Judgment if, if Saints Row 4 wasn't 60 fucking dollars. Right. Um, that's where that's why I trade in, and I feel like that's a why a lot of people also trade in is because games are just so expensive. They it's are. E it's just so much easier to trade in a game, get fifteen bucks off of, you know, the price, and be like, okay, I can I can afford forty five instead of sixty. Um, uh, so it's it's I feel like that it, there's a lot of that in there too, and I think that if you know digital games are you know forty bucks versus right. the sixty, people are going to be more amped to like. I don't need to trade this in because the next game that I want is going to be around my price range. Yeah. Um, but even if there are those people that still want to trade it in, still want to get rid of it because they just don't want to play it anymore, um, I think that's a really smart way. I think that there's also needs to be implemented like a uh, a trade in uh, um, what's it called uh, uh, a trade in value chart. That yeah. is always up. Yeah, so like, seriously. I, like, don't you hate it at times? Where like, and and I'm not gonna. I mean, like, I, I trade in games every once in a while. I haven't done it in like I don't know how many years or months. But like, wouldn't that be great to have? I mean, because like when you walk into like a a a, a GameStop and you trade in a game and you're like thinking, oh, I'm gonna get a good amount of credit out of this. It's like, nope, two bucks. What? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, see, I remember a couple of years ago, GameStop, when you walked into their store, they always had, like, the hottest games up on the thing with the trading credit that you would get for that. Mm. And um, I remember, like, uh, they used to not give you the prices that you could get for trade-in for systems. Mm -hmm. Just because, right. you know, every system could be in a different condition and whatnot. But for games, you know, it could be, you know, they had, like, what the games that were, like, the most popular out at that time what the trade-in value for that is, it should be listed on there, you know, like on a site, you know, their site, they could say how much you can trade it in for. Like Amazon will tell you, they're now starting to trade in games. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, um, uh, GameStop has it, has a trade-in thing on their website. Um, however, it's like, if the game came out less, or no, more than a year ago, it's not on their list. Mm. Which sucks, because that... That kind of, that kind of like cuts a lot of... Uh, a lot of games out of it. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, for, like, when I went to buy, uh, uh, um, Halo 4, I couldn't remember what game it was for, um, I went to trade in, um, uh, Battlefield 3. And, uh, because I had taken so much time before, like, trying to trade it in, um, when I went in, and this was this no joke, the guy goes, okay, um, I can give you, like, $4 store credit or $3 cash. And I was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, why is it so small? Like, my friend did it a week ago and it was 15 bucks. And he goes, I literally this morning changed the tax. I was, I, I, I came in this morning. The, the, the computer had told me that this, you know, this was to be marked down. And I literally changed that this morning. Hmm. And I was just like, so it went from, what, 16 bucks to, f like, 4 and he goes, yeah. And I was like, why did why was it such a drop? And he he explained to me that GameStop doesn't have a like a timed uh, thing where like a t yeah a timed appreciation. It's just like after this date, boom, it's that small now. And I think that's super shitty too. I think that that's a terrible way to kind of showcase trade in value. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that I think that over like if I go to Amazon and a game's like. Fifteen dollars trade in, and I go there. Then you know, like a month later, and it says like fourteen fifty. That makes sense to me. That works. Right. GameStop doesn't have anything like that. It's Definitely. just overnight. Yeah. It's it changes, and it's a deep change. And even you know, it's funny. It's like even GameStop has their own online digital distribution thing, like uh, Origin and Steam. The reason why I remember is because I uh, I won a copy of Dark for free from Game Informer, like a like a year Isn't ago. Isn't it Congregate? Um, I can't remember what it was called, but like I have it installed on my computer. It's like it's like GameStop something. It's basically like a, a, another version of like Steam in their in their own way. Um, and I, referring to their system. Huh? Say again? You're referring to the uh, Congregates. It's this thing that they have going through their website. Which says that uh, these are indie games supported by GameStop or whatever, and you know they're small, but you can 
pay to play or some are free to play and you can enjoy okay, it from so there. That's a little bit <laughs> different than what we're talking about then. I was thinking Congregate was their mobile dist- or their uh, game distribution, but I think they have a different system for that. Yeah. But the thing is the, the thing has got me thinking is about about this and I do you think that in a, in the future um, whether the whole entire Dragon Ball Z glasses thing actually works, thanks to Google. <laughs> um, do you think in the future that we're going to be rely- relying on servers to play our games for online? Or is that going to be something to where they'll divide it between actually downloading your game, um, playing it on your computer, versus you can play your game, but only if the server is on? I think I think honestly doing that system of you can only play the game if the server's on is absolute bullshit. Um, Agreed. <laughs> it, yeah, uh, no, there's, I agree there's, no, there's no way around it. If it's a single-player game, I shouldn't have to be online to play it. Mm-hmm. I, and there's no win. It's a no-win situation. I'm sorry to cut you off, but say something like uh, SimCity. They're paying to keep servers up, so that money that people spent on their game is now being spent on server costs. Yeah, I, I, ah, man. When the entire SimCity situation happened, not to veer off off you, Greg, real quickly, um, I just hate the fact that when companies like uh, have server problems when they launch, it's, uh, it's like, oh, we didn't expect this many people to buy the game. We are awfully surprised. Like, really? You're 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 fucking SimCity. You're you're one of the most popular uh, simulator out there for how many years, and you you don't you didn't know that? Wow. What, what's even what's you know what what really sucks about it is that. This is this is their idea of combating piracy. Yeah. That is another form of bullshit that I can't even fathom. I've said this on this podcast and other podcasts that I've done. Piracy is not as big of a problem as they think. The mm-hmm. problem is the fucking price of games. Yes. If yes. you don't if you yes. want people to buy your shit, if you want more people to play your game, stop making it stupid expensive. This is why people pirate this is why people just simply don't fucking buy. That it's it's, and, uh, it's if you don't mind me cutting you off here. Um, one thing that I am also slightly concerned with in regards to uh, them just trying to force the whole online distribution only aspect of gaming is that uh, it doesn't really offer any sort of protection to people who buy a lemon, so to speak. Yeah. Like if they go through yeah. and yeah. find something that's absolutely of poor quality, um, I hate to say it, Duke Nukem, right. uh, you know they can't just you know, have some sort of reassurance. They're just locked in with that, and you know, unfortunately, many people would try to pirate it just because of well, they want to try bad... it out. Well, yeah, I'm the, yeah, you know, and what I'm saying, well, you know, what I'm saying, right. it's it's not an absolute, right? But it's definitely like. I feel from the experience of people that I've talked to, like, why do you pirate a movie? Because I don't want to pay fucking ten twenty five to go see it. Mm-hmm. Why do you pirate this, you know, uh, CD or whatever? Because I don't want to pay a dollar a song, you know, whatever reason. It usually boils down to price. Like, mm-hmm. th- there was just an article that I read recently about Game of Thrones. I hate to go off the topic of video games, but this kind of goes into the piracy thing. Right. Um, it was an article. It was a show on YouTube. So Game of Thrones is the most pirated show in both 2011 and 2012. Mm. Um, and what's insane is that it is the most pirated show. It actually has more pirates or more uh, pirated episodes downloaded per yeah per episode per episode or whatever than actual viewers watching it. When it <laughs> um, however, wow. however. The DVD sales for Game of Thrones are through the fucking roof. It is the biggest sales um, amount that they've that HBO has ever seen for any of their shows. Even Sex in the City, for Christ's sake, <laughs> it's higher than that. Wow. And so the theory here is 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 piracy actually helping HBO? Mm-hmm. And 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 the reason that people pirate Game of Thrones is because HBO is a pay for channel. Yeah. Um, and it's expensive. It's like an extra twenty-five dollars on your fucking cable bill. It's ridiculous. Right. And then on top of that, um, 
you can only get HBO Go service, which I think a lot of people would actually get if it was like a s- separate individual thing. Mm-hmm. You can only have HBO Go if you have if you're subscribed to it on cable. Yeah. The thing is, the thing is though, is that I, uh, I mean, the thing is though, is that as I'm, as I'm listening to you guys talk about it, and as I start to let the gears in my head uh, think about this more, um. You know, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, the developers and the, and the game companies are going to say, you know, well, the reason why the prices for these games are so high is because, you know, it costs a lot of money to, to make these games in the first place. We're, we're at a point where making a game, a triple A game, is the exact same amount as making a, a, a movie at this point. Um, sure. And, I mean, it, the game industry has done this before. Like, I was like, I think it was in the early early 80s 90s where at, at at some point games were actually as high as like a hundred dollars a game um i think it might have been in the neo geo days pokemon stadium. say again oh pokemon stadium was uh is a perfectly good example it cost a hundred flats to get the n64 cartridge and the uh pack that you went through and slapped at the bottom of your controller yeah yeah the uh um uh star fox 64 was uh 70 something dollars yeah i remember that i actually still have the game (laughs) (laughs) um the 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 game has gone through before um and then only recently has gone back down and went back going back up right now and there's rumors saying that the new the next generation is gonna uh increase the game price even more than it is today um I mean that's you know what their argument is, but at the end of the day, um, like Jace, you're 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 a business guru. Like when you're selling the product, you gotta set, you gotta set it to a price where people can buy the game at the same t- or buy the product, but at the same time not have it too expensive and too out there for people to not be able to afford it and have have to go to pirate the thing to to get it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had a point where I've done uh, videos for people. I'll post it up on the website, and I'll say, okay, it's, say, $60 to download it. Or I'll have a photo, and my prices are actually really reasonable for uh, photography. They'll go and screen cap it. And I'm like, you're going to screen cap it. You know, I spent all this work, gas money, whatever, to take that photo, and you're not going to pay $0.99 to download that photo. Or you're not going to pay $10 to download a set of uh, 25 photos. You know, that becomes to the point where it's like, well, you know, there's ways around that. You know, it's not like I can have a big DRM on a photo or a DRM on a video that is online. Mm-hmm. But, you know, for something for game companies, you know, going to digital distribution, I think, is the way. Because you're going to save money on packaging, discs, putting them in stores that kind of money you can lower your prices the lower the price is the more people are going to go out and buy it and then also say if steam is the one that does this i think they need to have two systems in place they need to have a system where um you can try out the game like playstation network does for the playstation plus users and um they basically let you try out the game for an hour Oh, I see. A, not, yeah. not, not, not demos, but just like the entire... No, it's like the full game, and you get it for a complete hour for free. Mm. If you're Well, if you're subscribed to PlayStation Plus, which is $50 a year. Yeah. So you can demo the game that way, and then if they like it, you can buy the game, but have the game at a subsidized price, like, say, the $30 range, mm. instead of the $60 for a hard copy. I think they would sell a lot more, and it would kind of weed out like those lemon games like duke nukem you yeah. know you have an hour to actually see what it is definitely and the full game and not just a small demo yeah definitely i agree now as much as i love to play demos to see what the game is like um they are just portions of the game that the company gives you to play um and they believe as like the most best parts that probably they believe is or you know the most um fun part of the game well, it may not be the same case when you buy the game. It's like, oh, that was only a small portion of the game. This other part of the game is pretty boring. Um, I really like the idea, and I think, I think first of all, Val should hire you. Um, and then second, uh, take your idea and implement the Steam. That'd be awesome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, if you're listening right now, uh, <laughs> my contact information can be found. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have we have to summon summon Gabe Newell. 
Oh yes, we have to do the the, the game Newell chant. <laughs> put, yeah. put a bunch of valve uh, valve games in a circle, <laughs> and then uh, make it the side shape of a pentagram. <laughs> we got we got we got to place two of the games added added uh, on the on the carpet. Um, we, we, of course, valve can't count to three, so you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it's very similar to Beetlejuice, except we go Gabe Newell, Gabe Newell. Um, <laughs> he appears up behind you, like yes, you have summoned me. What do you want? <laughs> um, but uh, joking aside, um, the thing that's got me worried about this next generation of consoles um, is that, uh, so as far as I know, that the PS4 will not be able to play your PSN library, in that pretty much. It, it, it sucks balls just flat out yeah um i'm not quite sure what the xbox live thing is going to be i think if anything microsoft's going to incorporate that into their next console i don't really see them really not allowing you to play your old xbox games on your uh or you know xbox live games on your new console um just because like when xbox 360 came out like they had they, they made sure that halo 2 worked on that console because like they like every other console launch like they always launch like seven seven crappy ones and then like two good ones um yeah so i'm not quite sure so like i'm not quite sure how it's gonna be how it's gonna be but well here's the thing with the uh, ps4 i take it almost like the vita and i've been playing the vita for since it launched i got it launch day mm -hmm. um it was the same with the PSN library. The uh, PSN games were not compatible with the Vita right out of the box. They had to be converted, but I have to say PlayStation did do a good job, and they got, I think, about 90-something percent of the games compatible now with the Vita. So I see that being something with the PS4, being that it's going to be a new architecture for the system, um, they probably will have to build in an emulator running on the system because I guess it's almost computer hardware now. Right. So build in an emulator and then they're going to start porting the games to be compatible just like they had to do with the Vita. So, you know, I don't think it's going to be a hindrance, but it might take, you know, a couple months before your game might work on there. Right, definitely. And I, the, the, the thing they announced at the press conference when me and Greg were talking about it afterwards is that they have or they have in the works a cloud system where they were able to play – excuse me as I burp to the mic. Um, okay, uh, so uh, <laughs> like um, they had – I could it, smell it. <laughs> <laughs> um, they had announced that they have a cloud system uh, there in the works for the PS4 where you'll be able to play your PS1 – through PS3 games on the PS4 through a cloud system, whether it be, you know, something you got to pay for or not, which me and Greg agreed, like, that's, that's fucking awesome, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's going to be, you know, ready for launch, I, I doubt it, but um, it's something in the works. Um, but, yeah, like, I'm just, I'm just worried. I'm just worried as far as, like, how the future... My, be... here's, here's my honest uh, prediction on how the game industry is going to go. Um... Gamers are going to get tired of certain things, and the developers are going to notice that, the, the major developers. And they're going to try to figure out a way around it. And it's not going to be for another 10 to possibly 20 years before it is perfected. Mm -hmm. And that there is a system in, in place that gamers will accept, and it being correct. My theory is 10 years. I, you know, some people say it's 20, whatever. Right. But my, my honest prediction is that Games will be completely digital. There will be no physical copies of video games anymore after, like, I don't know, 2020? 2020? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, gamers will be, it'll just be an accepted thing in the world that if you want to play a video game, you have to download it digitally. Yeah. Now, how, how it's implemented, how it, you know, how it works, I have no fucking clue. Uh, you know, who does? Right. But... I feel that that's how it's going to go. I mean, the guy that, for Christ's sake, the guy that predicted Siri says that we're going to have, in 20 years, um, artificial limbs that work like Luke Skywalker's. He predicted Siri, like, on the nose. Mm -hmm. Year and time or whatever. And it's just like, okay, well, if he says that, then I feel like games is kind of, gaming Gaming's going to go in the same light. It's either, we're either going to have a drought like, you know, there was in the early 80s. Yeah, the, the game, or, game industry crash. <laughs> right. 
or um, it's just going to rise above and gaming is going to be in a whole new light. And, you know, because more and more gamers are, are wanting to play these beautiful artistic games that have a lot of thought into them, um, like a lot of the indie stuff that was shown at PAX, uh, I think gaming is slowly but surely becoming more accepted as a form of art by society than than previously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely also, agree. Also, um, going on that, I don't think right now prices on games are going to change. But um, looking at how technology is shifting right now and these uh, sites are coming out for music and digital book trading... Um, I do see possible game trading, like digital game copies, getting traded within the next two to three years. Since this is already something like music trading, Apple is already working on. I think Google is also working with, and Amazon, working on something like this. I can see the game industry picking up on that to move along Absolutely. with games. That would be, so, yeah. Oh, I can man. see that coming up in the near future maybe another two, three years before we might see something come out with that. Uh, as for game prices changing, I think they have pretty much have it at like their $60 for new games and then maybe a little bit less for a digital copy. I don't see that changing until digital copies become the norm. Right, right, definitely. Right. Um, Chris, uh, what's your take so far? Because you've been... I know you've been listening to this entire conversation, but like, what's your take as far as, far as like what possibly the future may be for, for the game industry and the digital downloads and whatnot? Yeah, sorry, I kind of haven't been chiming in because uh, on my end, the connection's been pretty poor and I've had a lot of breakups in there. But <clears throat> honestly, though, if I could see the gaming industry working towards actually offering the player some sort of insurance for what they're providing and actually working with them rather than just providing something for a profit, then I can see the online venue working out to be rather well. Considering that a lot of games now have uh, been working towards actually telling full-length stories rather than just entertaining over, you know, a huge change that's been made over the past 30 years... Mm-hmm. It goes to show that, you know, that they can't really BS a final product anymore, and that when it comes to making a game, you're obviously going to be subject to your audience's whims. Mm-hmm. The concerns that I do have, however, are uh, uh, for people who uh, currently have Steam, as I'm sure that the problem is, well, has happened on a few occasions. Before we started this podcast, I tried to get into my Steam account um, since it crashed on me, and for whatever reason, I could not log in, even though I was entering the same password. Mm -hmm. So, concern number one that I have is that uh, since there's no, you know, physical assurance that can possibly be made through having digital copies, it does beg the question of how easy it is to access other people's things and if it's really as safe a venture as possible. Right. Additionally, if one were to do a bit of prying into that to, you know, kind of segue into this point, um... All it takes is a little bit of prying once you've gotten into someone's account to say, oh, hey, by the way, I now know their credit card information so I can buy stuff for my own account. Right. Or, in this case, gift it to someone else, which isn't impossible, but is, again, you know, a thought that I think is worth considering as a concern. Um, however, I can see that by having digital copies it is more malleable and easy to fix problems that may occur over the course of development or if there's a fatal error that happened to not show up when they were going through and testing a product right right um and uh to use steam as it uh as an example again one thing that i 
had a pretty high appreciation for is the Steam Workshop, where various other random people can add their own texture packs, they can add extra content, and uh, if any one of you guys has Skyrim on your Steam accounts, I'm sure you've been able to see all the additions that you can work with. Definitely. Which, um, and if game developers look into that, they can see, you know, which things that they could possibly implement for another project. And it can be some sort of correlative, or not correlative, um, uh, a, a conjunctive effort between... There we go. That's probably a better word that I could use. Collaboration, collaborative. But, um, yeah. Yeah, they can collaborate with each other, both gamers and the developers, and make uh, better products, you know, after each one puts in their own inputs. Definitely. And, uh, oh, I was uh, also going to uh, top that by saying that for some games, uh, I'll just keep using Skyrim as an example since it maps out pretty well. People can also use uh, curse clients to add content to their games and use other modification programs to extend the amount of enjoyable gameplay that they can work out of one game. So I think when it boils down to it, um, the big concerns that I have about them actually moving over to a digital output is uh, security, both financial and content-wise, and the ability to, you know, potentially bring up or destroy a product based off of everyone putting in their own opinions yeah. and their own content. I, I definitely agree in many points uh, of your uh, of your statements. Um, I, I honestly, Steam I think is far uh, far ahead of everybody else when it comes to a platform where they can, where they can not only put the game out, but they have a system for where people are making mods that they have it integrated into Steam to where you can load up you know Skyrim and say oh we had this mod you want to download it sure and it'll be downloaded to your uh, game without ever have to go through the long uh, long journey of trying to put a file in the right place. Or typing in some code to make sure that mod worked. Um, that 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 part of Steam I, I do enjoy, along with there are supporting in, any developers with the um, what we call it green light, it was called or something like that. And they uh, have, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, and they have it to where you know people can, the community can vote on you know which game they would like to have next, and that's awesome. Um, the point that I want to talk, I want to I want to uh, say is that. Um, as you were talking about how sometimes maybe digital downloads may not work as well, um, and like in this case where uh, you're locked out of Steam and can't get your games, you know, it did come up, the, the argument that does come up to say like, you know, well, if you had a physical copy of the game, yeah, what, what would happen to you? Which I, I do agree. In, in some instances, you know, a physical copy of a game would be great uh, just in time for the server may be down. And as I burp again, um, <laughs> And the thing is, though, you know, it got me thinking. As much as we are going into digital downloads, um, would it be possible to say, um, what if, like, these game companies who are wanting to go digital say that they are want to rely on their servers, but in the cases that they may not have their servers up or the servers may be down, like, would it be fair for for them to say give you a physical copy of the game if it's just you know just the CD itself you know um, would that be a thing to that that that, that you that you know so I'll I'll, I'll 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 like to see some maybe like that but do you guys think that maybe it's possible? You know, actually, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, you know, actually, since you bring that, it does bring into mind a couple ideas. Uh, the first option that they could do is um, you know just throwing this out there, you know, say you go through and you buy your copy of the game, and say if you wanted to, uh, I'll just, since I've been using the word a lot, let's say that you wanted to insure your copy of the game. So what you can do is put in, um, or from wherever you're buying it from, they'll sell it at a discounted rate, and if you wanted to 
you know, if you're in an area that has poor connection or you're maybe doing this off of your phone or whatever, you can maybe send in an order saying, hey, uh, if possible, can I get a physical copy mailed to my house or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, option, two, uh, option two that I have in mind that they could possibly work with is, um, uh, you know how, like, at places like my current employer, Fry's Electronics or Best Buy or wherever, where you can buy these packs of rewritable Blu-ray discs, well, what if they have a licensing right to say that the copy can only work on one computer, one that has already been registered, and that you can just burn a, you know, if you can burn the game onto the disc itself, and as you mentioned, if servers are down or if there's something wrong with the online portion of the game, you can still enjoy a single player option, you know, from the comfort of your own home. I have another option actually too. Um, a lot of software lo um, uses USB keys. Um, you could say like for Steam, you have a specific key that you order from Steam that has a specific code to it. When you buy a game, it registers that in the computer with a specific code. Say if you don't have a network connection, plug in that key, it automatically recognizes that, oh, this is that person, I can now then play the game. Or offering a physical copy on, say, a USB stick, you know, that can only play from that stick. It can't play, you know, from duplication. Interesting. That would be an inter interesting way, because, like, interesting. because the thing is, though, we, most of our, our devices does use USB, um, it'd be a computer, um, well, Mac, <laughs> Macs, PCs, um, other devices that you could possibly use it for. Um, and considering these can have a storage space of up to 120 gigs that I've seen so far, they can easily hold that as well as any download content that you can have. But yeah, that'd be cool. Just if for yeah, but like for a traditionalist like myself that wants to go with a disc, Blu-ray discs are available to you know burn stuff onto. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. But, you know that's just not out there. That be, yeah. You no, know, the idea you put out there is really good. I, you know, it's funny. Yeah, we, yeah. You, because it doesn't like uh, Warcraft. Uh, I know, or um, Star Wars Online. They use uh, some people order USB sticks that have special codes to um, lock their accounts. Mm. Um, so I'm saying like. Hey, you know, if Steam servers are down, can't authenticate a game, you have a stick that you order from Steam, say if they want to charge like three dollars. Right. But it's linked to your account and if you're offline, you're on a plane, you're out of town, in a car or something, plug that stick in and authenticates the game for you. Hmm. Oh yeah, that'd be totally awesome. Oh shit. Oh, am I still on? Okay, never mind. Wait. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's it's my headphones. Yeah. <laughs> They're going in and out for some odd reason. Um. Anyways, um, as I fumble around with this, um, you know, talking about it now, and because like I had my concerns about the game industry and where it's heading, and kind of you know feeling you know maybe, you know maybe we're going to an age where digital downloads are going to be the thing that we're going to be doing, which we probably are, but at the same time, um, like I think was it Chris pointed out like. And in, in, if a server does go down, like what say what what say to stop somebody uh, taking the host their own private server and host a game on there for you know whoever wants to you know play on there and can continue to play the game. So it's not like it's not like you know what, what it is now where you know if, the only way you can play Diablo three is is if the Blizzard server is on. But this is now in. In a few years, maybe you know, 10, 15 years, like maybe everything will be taken care of and figured out. Um, like all things, you know, there's a few bumps in the road you get to go through before you can actually, you know, make something that is awesome. So, yeah. I think we're going through a transition stage, honestly, right now, yeah. because we have oh, new systems really coming out. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything's moving towards the digital world right now, so we're in this transition where things are going to start shifting. So it might be really bumpy for the next few years. 
Yeah, but you know, I like agree. the music I industry agree. worked out. I mean, when Apple That's first true, started yeah. with the iTunes and buying digitally, you know, we had the big thing like, um, what was it, Napster? Yeah, we had a big problem with that. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> so it we're not as bad as that oh, right now, but Napster. we're going through that phase of MP3 downloads, but now with games. Mm-hmm. Yep. Definitely. Awesome. <laughs> Um, well, I'd like to thank you guys for joining me on this podcast. Um, and uh, again, um, it's been a long time since we had one. So if this podcast is any particularly longer than expected, uh, well, you know, we miss you guys. And, you know, this is a, uh, a welcome return. <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, Jace, where can I find you on the Internet? Oh, Facebook um, forward slash rave to the J or on Twitter. Um, that's rave to the Jace with the number two, or my website rave to the J photography dot com. Awesome. Um, I just love how you said the first part. It's like, oh, Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> Facebook. It's where the sexy people come. From. <laughs> well, that's where all my fans are. That's where I post a lot of my information from everywhere. Kind of congregates there. So, awesome. Sweet. Um, Chris, where can I find you on the internet? Well, you see, <laughs> I've got a couple sh- sh- to go with. Oh shit, Sean Connery's here. Frankly, <laughs> I think it's Okay, I'm gonna hand the act. Um, <laughs> uh, you guys can find me on Facebook. <laughs> Crime. God damn it, Anthony, stop laughing. Uh, anyway, you guys can find me on Facebook. I, uh, I have... I work with two pages, of course. One is my own, Kaz Cosplay, K-A-Z Cosplay. Um, I go through and I just make sure to post cosplay-related content, make sure that you know everyone from that good to bad, as long as I can see you know that there was a good effort in cosplay attempted, then I'll you know share some publicity through there you know i like to you know raise everyone's spirits as best i can and uh of course you guys can find me on mission start podcasts website, which is missionstartpodcast.com and of course the facebook page uh facebook.com slash mission start podcast awesome of course chris is always there living in the facebook feed he's like a troll he just lives there <laughs> i try to keep you Entertaining, <laughs> kinda. Um, Greg, where can they find you on the internet? You can find me on uh, Twitter under Chub Rock Geek or at Chub Rock Geek. Um, I also recommend downloading the uh, Twitter app called Vine. Oh yes, um, yes. <laughs> it's it is a lot of fun. Basically, you record six seconds of video. But you record it in such a way that, like, you it's only recording when you touch the screen. So people have, like, really funny, ed- like, quick six-second edited videos on there. And it's it's a blast. I love I love Vine. Yes. So it's um, almost like Keek, but uh, a little bit more fun. Best app yeah, ever. Like, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's I, I highly recommend it. But you can find me on there, too. Um, you can find my uh, blog that I do every once in a while called The Geek Losing It on YouTube. And um, I'm sometimes on creatov.com, mm. which is C-R-E-A-T-O-V, T-E-O-V, sorry, dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, I, think, I think the overtime is done. Oh. I'm, yeah, we're going to have a last episode eventually here, and then it's, then it's over. Oh. Um, so. I think that's just simply because... I want to move on to other things. I want to try other things, and 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 it's it's not in the way, but I definitely want to give it a a farewell episode, if you will. Damn. What will, um, what will, what will be the last episode? Like, what's the number on that going to be? Uh, I don't remember. Like thirty something. Uh, okay. I didn't do too many of them. And that, that was an issue too. Is like, it was really hard to get people together to do the episode. So and and even though I liked the structure. I gotta, I gotta move, I gotta, I gotta move it on and okay. do other things. But mm-hmm. um, I still write articles. Well, great. So you can go, to, you can go to the website and read them there. Mm, awesome, sweet. Um, yeah, Greg. Uh, I the overtime was an awesome podcast, and uh, you know, sad to see it go away. But you know, hey, life happens. 
Yeah. Um, and you can follow me if you guys want to uh, on Twitter at Defective Naruto, where I post various stuff from our Facebook and other stuff from Mission Start Podcast. Um, and you can also find me on the website, of course, at missionstartpodcast.com. Uh, all the video content and all the uh, reviews, previews, convention footage is all there. Uh, especially this next weekend when I'm 